What we're doing is we're wrapping up our series. This is week six of six of a series called Wise Decision about how we make wise decisions. And if you haven't been with us, here's our approach. If you have a wise decision that you're trying to make right in front of you, we're just saying take that decision and throw it in the hopper. And every week we're giving a question. And the questions are hopefully to filter out the foolishness. And what trickles out of all of these questions we're asking is some wisdom to make a wise decision right at the bottom. And so here's how we're going to wrap this series up today. Is anybody, why are you laughing already? <laughs> you just know we're in trouble, huh? Um, do you know how to peel a banana? Yeah, everyone says they do, but not everybody knows how to peel a banana. See, there's the karate method, okay? Grew up watching Bruce Lee films. Are you ready? Yeah! Are you impressed now, huh? It's all in the kya part of it, okay? I don't recommend doing this while you're driving. You do this, no hands free, driving with your knee, doesn't work real well. Okay, so there's one method. Now, some of you are going to relate to this method right here. Um, It's called the bite method. See my pain? (laughs) How many of you do this? Raise your hand. No lying in church. All right? Yes. The Spirit of God is about to set you free from your bitter life. Okay? Because this is disgusting. It doesn't taste good. And then you take another. It's just bad. Okay? So uh, let's see if we can figure out another couple ones. Okay. Another way to open a banana goes like this. You pull out your knife, cut here. I know someone's sitting out here going, Mom, Dad, the pastor's packing a knife. (laughs) Think about when I do an altar call, you know, offering to accept Jesus at the end. Think about that differently now. Pastor's packing a knife. Um, So you just kind of do like a little surgery on this thing, cut it down here, cut it right here, you know, and we'll, we'll just stop there. So right there. And it's, it's a beautiful peel job, right? Who has time for that, people? Like, no one does. So, there's other methods here. Let me see if I got them all. Um, knife, oh, this is, this is a cool one. I just learned this. Never knew this. It's called the throw method. Are you ready? <laughs> Y'all are getting nervous in the front row. <laughs> Why is that? Does anyone else know the throw method? You, you hold it right here, and um, you point it towards you, and you, you just... <laughs> Why are your hands up? <laughs> you getting all charismatic on me, or what? <laughs> It's it's real simple. See if we can do this. Ready? The throw method. You're all terrified for nothing now. Um, So those are just some methods. Now, here's what I want to do. I'm going to show you the right way to peel a banana. Who says that this is the top? Like, there's a reason not to do all of these, right? Like, when you do the throw method, it gets all mushy. And most people, I've been doing this for years until this point. I'm now changing the method that I've always done. I, I used to do this. Who says that that's the top? All you got to do is just pinch the end right there. You just had like a Holy Spirit moment right there, didn't you? Yeah, and now you can peel it. And see that that little tip right there? You can just pinch that off and throw that little brown thing away because who eats that anyways, right? I just changed your life. Here's what's funny. Why do you peel the banana the way that you do? It's because somewhere, somewhere down the road, no one even said, hey, watch me. I'm about to teach you how to peel a banana. You just watched your mama do it that way, right? Or you watched your dad or somebody did it that way, and that's just how you always peeled bananas. I'm going to horrify you for a moment. You are your mom. You learn all kinds of things from them that maybe you didn't mean to learn it from them, but that's just why you do what you do. This is why we're, we're teaching this series on wise decisions, not to teach you how to peel a banana, but I want you to start thinking about why do I make the financial decisions I make? Because my parents made those decisions? Well, how did it turn out for them? Maybe it turned out great for them. Maybe it didn't. Well, why do you make the relationship decisions you make? Why do you make the health decisions that you make? Why do you make the following God decisions that you make? Somewhere down the line, you watch somebody else's life, and you just kind of intuitively started making decisions that way. And so the questions that we've been asking you every week are hopefully to bring you to the scriptures, to bring you to God and say, how does God want you to make wise decisions? Are you still with me? So here, here's what we're going to do today. We started this series by looking at Solomon's life. By the way, look in your notes real quick. Open those up. You'll find a little card in there. We gave you all six of the questions that we've been through before. And we're going to add one more for the final week today. And we'll call it quits there and move on to a new series next week. Um, we started the series, though, by looking at Solomon in his life. He's touted in the scriptures as the wisest man walking the face of the earth. And his 
His uh, writings, his Proverbs are recorded in the book of Proverbs as wisdom sayings for you and I to glean wisdom. So get this, he's given this gift of wisdom, his writings are recorded for you and I to learn from, so kind of how I want to land today is, let's take a look at the end of Solomon's life. Let's see not how his life just starts, but, but how it ends up. So here's what I want you to do, if you've got a Bible, open up to 1 Kings chapter 2, Old Testament, if you, uh, if you don't have a Bible, grab one out of the chair in front of you. And uh, if you don't have a Bible at home, take that Bible home. We'll replace it. We, we want everybody to have a Bible, okay? If you have a digital device, pull that thing out. Um, 1 Kings chapter 2. If you need some help finding that, seriously, go to table of contents. It's probably like page 273 or something like that. I just made that up. I'm guessing, all right? Solomon's life. Hold on. I don't think I can preach with a knife in front of me and a banana. Okay. Here's how Solomon's life begins. He gets a blessing from his dad. Remember whose dad is? King David. And before David is about to die, he gives him this blessing. I'm in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 2. And here's what David, his dad, says to him. I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Kind of a flowery way of saying he's about to die. So be strong. Act like a man. It's an interesting statement for a dad to make to his kid. But he defines what he thinks acting like a man is. He says... And observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him. Keep his decrees and command, his laws and regulation as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. Did your dad give you a blessing? I I don't know. Hopefully he did. Maybe it was godly wisdom or godly blessing. I mean, some of your dads, they didn't. Your dad might have said something like, you'll never amount to anything. You walked out the door and that's the last you talked to him. I I get it. But Solomon grew up with a pretty amazing blessing. He's like, listen, his dad tells him, act like a man. And here's what it means to act like a man. Know what God wants. Follow God with everything that you have. Obey his commands. And God gives him, his dad tells him, hey, listen, if you're going to prosper in life, if you're going to do really well, the life that God has for you is the best life. But to be a man means this, walk with God. It's a pretty amazing blessing. And it's interesting Because Solomon, he gets this perspective on his life. Perspective is incredible. We're going to talk about this a little bit before we get into um, the the rest of his life. Just perspective is that we live in dependence upon God. And so God shows up in Solomon's life. You know this story. He shows up. He says, Solomon, I'm going to give you a blank check. Whatever it is that you want, I'm going to give it to you. What do you want? And if you know how this story goes, I'm going to walk you through some of his life. Here's chapter 3, verse 5. Just keep following along with me. If you have a pen, underline, highlight, put a little star by some of these verses. And this week, when you sit down in the morning to kind of spend time with God, go back and read these. Chapter 3, verse 5 says this. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. It's yours. Solomon's perspective, because his dad had given him a blessing, is this. Here's his response. I'm only like a little kid. I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart. God, give me wisdom to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong for who is able to govern this great people of yours. Do you get Solomon's perspective? His perspective is this. God, I need you, and I don't know what you were thinking making me king, but I'm supposed to rule these people. I'm just like a little kid. I don't even know. God, give me your wisdom. And God's totally impressed by his answer. Because it shows a tremendous amount of humility. And so God says this, Solomon, because you answered that way, you didn't ask for money, you didn't ask for power, you didn't ask for fame. He says, I'm going to give you all the wisdom that you could ever want. Not only that, but I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you respect of your peers. I'm going to give you honor. I'm going to give you long life. And he blesses him with this God's gift of wisdom and even beyond wisdom. He just blesses his life. And wouldn't it be awesome If the story like ended there and they all lived happily ever after. But it doesn't end there. It's interesting because there's a moment in his life where he starts to show a crack in character. And what I mean is if you flip over, go to, um, let's go to chapter 6. And what precedes this is Solomon builds God a house. I know it's kind of weird to think of building God a house. He builds him a temple. And God says this, you build me this temple and it's going to be the place where my presence will always dwell. Meaning this, if you wanted to talk to God, you could go to the temple and you knew God would meet you there. How many of you, if I said, hey, if I invited you to pray and I could promise you 100% guarantee God would meet you, wouldn't you be excited? I'd be like, but you have to go to this place. (laughs) That's what the temple was. 
he builds God a house, and he builds the house for seven years. And after the end of seven years, after Solomon's done building God's house, you know what he does? He builds himself a house. But here's what the scripture says. Chapter 6, very last verse. The temple was finished in all its details according to its specifications. He had spent seven years building it. Next chapter. It took Solomon 13 years, however, and it's that word however that caught my attention. Like, hey, you built a house for God for seven years. Way to go. That's awesome. God liked it. However, it took him 13 years to complete the destruction of his own palace. I, I don't want to make too much of this. The Bible doesn't show a lot of commentary on it. But it made me wonder, you spend seven years building God a house and then you build a bigger, better one in 13 years for yourself? And I'm just wondering, is this a foreshadowing of what it is that's about to come in Solomon's life? Like he gave God honor and due respect, but he saved his very best for himself. I was just wondering, is this a moment where self-indulgence starts showing up in Solomon's life? So get this. The second time God shows up to speak to Solomon, he gives him a warning. Remember the first time he gave him a blank check, ask whatever you want. Here's the second time. God comes and he just gives him a warning. Go all the way to chapter 9. I know we're like all over the place, but I'm like, I'm literally giving you Solomon's whole life in like 10 minutes. Chapter 9, verse 4, here's what it says. Underline verse, the beginning of verse 4, it says, as for you, if you walk before me faithfully, just underline that whole thing. If you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a successor on the throne of Israel. He goes, follow me, obey me, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you the things that you never even knew you wanted or needed. But then look at verse 6. Because this is the opposite. And you could underline this, but if you or your descendants turn away from me, well, what do you mean, God? Like, turn away from me. Like, if we stop going to church, turn away from you? Or like, um, if if I go watch a movie that I probably shouldn't go watch, I mean, is is that kind of turn away from you? Like, we start coming up with our list of what it looks like to turn away from God. And it continues, and he gets real specific. But if you or your descendants turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I've given you, But then here it is, ready? Here's what he specifically means. And you go off to serve other gods and worship them. That's it? God, you are afraid that one day I would go worship these other gods? Like I would go to some pagan ritual thing and I would go bow down to a wooden pole of some sort that people call God or bow down to this golden calf thing? Like, like, God, who, who would do that? God, it's me, Solomon. Like, my mom and dad went to church. They taught me to go to church. Their parents before them went to church. Before they they went to church. God, who do you think you're talking to? I mean, I have a rich family legacy of people who followed you. Not only that, but I'm the wisest dude around. Like, I'm going to get this right. It's almost like Solomon doesn't even hear it. God, thank you for the warning. Totally appreciate it. But God's not done yet. He goes, let me just tell you what's going to happen if you go and worship other gods. By the way, there's a lot of people in the scripture, you know their stories, probably if you've been reading the Bible at all, about people who said, ah, God, I'll never deny you. Hmm. And God says, let me just make note of this. If you worship other gods and you walk away from me, he said, you know that nice house you built for me? I'm going to wreck it. I'm going to wreck it and your reputation's on it. And anytime anybody walks by and looks at that place, you're going to feel the shame of, man, what did Solomon do against God that the house he built him was wrecked? So God gives him this warning And then chapter 9 and 10, let me just paraphrase it for you. Here's all the awesome things that Solomon did and the places he built that were beautiful. That's chapters 9 and 10, okay? It's the abbreviated version. Go to chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the equivalent to a horror movie. Have you ever watched a horror movie? Um, Some of you are like, I never watch horror movies. Just don't do it. You'll get this, though. You know, like there's a couple, and they're walking in the dark on the streets, and then one of them says, I know, we should take the shortcut through the cemetery, it's, it's like that moment. Have you watched a Geico commercial where they're all running from someone and they go, oh, look, let's hide in the shed with chainsaws. It's that moment where you're watching it and you just want to go, no, and you just, not the cemetery, not the shed with chainsaws. 
It's this moment in Solomon's life. I'm calling it the nevertheless moment because it's that one word that really wrecks Solomon's life. Here it is, chapter 11, verse 1. Here was Solomon's problem. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. Um, Two problems here. Number one, he loved foreign women. This is not like a statement about interracial marriage, okay? That that is not what this is about. (laughs) Some of you are like, okay. Um, This is a statement about Solomon bringing a woman into his house who worshipped other pagan gods and thinking, Oh, God, seriously, I'm I'm the wisest man in the world. What makes you think that I can't bring this woman into my house and just turn her to you, God? We we call this missionary dating, by the way. God, surely when they come and they, they love me, surely I'll be able to steer them in your direction. So his first problem was this. He loved women who weren't followers of God. But here's his second problem. It says that he loved not just a foreign woman. He loved many foreign women. And here's how... The scripture goes, it says, he loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites, Redhead Dites, Brunette Dites, and Blondonians, and everything in between. It's a loose paraphrase of the scriptures. Verse two, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, and here's God's direct word to the nation, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts After their gods. Can you just hear Solomon? Yeah, that's good for everybody else. But this is me. I'm I'm the wisest man around. I didn't even go to other people for advice because who am I going to go to? Like, I'm the smartest guy in the room. In Deuteronomy 17 17, it says this He, the king, must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. I mean, the scripture was there. Now, if you go back to chapter 11, here's what it says. And this is the word that changed the outcome of Solomon's life. It says, nevertheless. Meaning, dude, you knew. You were warned. You had the scriptures to direct you, all the evidence that this was a bad, unwise decision, that this thing could wreck your life. It was all right there in front of you. And it says, nevertheless. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. It didn't say held fast to her in love. It said to them. Well, what does them mean? It goes on to describe it. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 mistresses. Could you imagine Valentine's Day? (laughs) Can you imagine if you forgot Valentine's Day? You would have a thousand angry women at you. I, I can't even conceive. Now, let me see if I can make this even more horrific. It goes on to describe the kind of gods that these women worship. One god was called Ashtoreth, who is this goddess of fertility. And um, I'm going to keep this PG if I can, but a part of the, the goddess of fertility worship would involve temple prostitution. You go into church for a prostitute. Really? Really? You brought that woman into your house, Solomon? Maybe with every good intention of I'm going to steer her to the way of the one true God? It also says they also worship the God of Moloch. Now, if you do research on this, you'll find out that the God of Moloch, part of the annual uh, festivals, involved human sacrifice, child sacrifice. Solomon. You're an idiot. For the wisest guy around, you have no common sense whatsoever. You brought women into your house. They were involved in temple prostitution and human sacrifice as calling it worshiping the gods. And you thought that you could bring them into your house and remain unscathed? I mean, you had one wife, and I don't know how long it took him to think about, should I do this, should I not do this with the second wife? But I'm assuming like the 699th wife, he didn't even blink an eye like, oh, another good looking woman. Hey, why don't you be my wife? And it's, it's just the truth with when we wander from God. It's like the first time we're like, oh, we think about it for a long time. I wonder if I should. And by the thousandth time, 
we're just making decisions based off of how we've always made decisions or people have modeled it for us. Now, I'm kind of beating up Solomon, right? We all look at him and go, he's a total idiot, right? But um, can we just be sympathetic for a moment? Because how many of you had a nevertheless moment? <laughs> you knew it wasn't the right thing to do. You're like, I know I shouldn't do this, but um, I'm nevertheless. And maybe the consequences for you weren't as big as Solomon, but we've all had nevertheless moments. Let me prove it to you. Um, anyone going out to dinner for Valentine's Day? Some of you are like looking at your spouse. We going out to dinner? <laughs> Just raise your hand. Yes, we are. Make a reservation right after service. Um, anybody going to Cheesecake Factory today? Oh yeah, Bob in the back. Awesome. Let me ruin this for you. Um, this dessert right here is known as the Chocolate Tower Truffle Cake. It's from the Cheesecake Factory. It weighs in at an astounding 1,680 calories. It is the equivalent to a double-double, not just one, but two double-doubles with onions, a package of Reese's peanut butter cups, and uh, a Diet Coke. Because when you're eating that much food, you just got to wash it down with Diet Coke. Um, the crazy part is, when do we eat the chocolate tower truffle cake? After a meal. That won't kill you right away. It's going to hurt you but it won't kill you right away. It is not a wise decision at any point in time. But we make that decision, don't we? And you're like, hey, 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 listen. You only live once, right? YOLO. <laughs> How come we say stuff like you only live once after right when we're about ready to like make a stupid decision? No one says you only live once and put the credit card back in their pocket and walk away. No, no one says you only live once and put the fork down. You know what I'm saying? Like, we always say, hey, you only live once, and then we do something incredibly risky. Um, here's my point. This is in your notes. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, failed miserably at making wise decisions because he lost perspective. He had it, and he lost it. What I mean when I say he had it, he understood that his life was meant to be lived dependent on God to help him make wise decisions. He was there to follow God, to be with God, to walk in relationship with God. Let me, let me read to you Psalm 90, verse 12. It says this, teach us to number our days. This is almost like a prayer to God. God, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. God, I want to see what it looks like down the road. A year, 10 years, 30 years. Hey, God, when I'm 102, I ain't never making it to 102, I know it. But down the road, the man I am today and the, the decisions I'm making, give me a glimpse about what my days look like ahead. Because every decision I'm about to make is going to put me on a path, and I want to know where that path leads. Now, please hear me in this, because some of you are like, man, the pastor is like loading on the guilt today. No, no, I don't want you to hear guilt, because some of you have made some decisions in your life, and it has put you on a path and it's been a path of pain, and I'm not here to load on the guilt or the shame. Because I want to tell you this, it is never too late, no one is ever beyond God's reach to get off the path that you're on and have a turning point moment and now follow God. There might see, be some consequences here now for the decisions that you've made, but the truth is it's never too late to come back to God. But the scripture says, God, I, I want to have the kind of wisdom that has perspective that says, I want to make decisions today that are a blessing tomorrow. Psalm 39, 4 says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Meaning, I think I always have tomorrow to, to make that wise decision and make that an investment to do the thing that I know is, is the right thing to do. God, give me the kind of wisdom that just says, I'm going to do it right now. Here's a couple notes on perspective. Perspective is when we recognize that wise decisions often come with delayed gratification, Here's what we're going to call these, investments. Delayed gratification. You make the decision now and it doesn't pay off right away. There's got to be some time before it actually pays off. Here's the other part of perspective, though. Perspective filters out making decisions based on short-term emotional benefits. Let's go back to the chocolate cake for just a minute. I'm getting hungry. How come I'm using this as a negative example and all of a sudden I'm tempted? Go to the chocolate cake. You're going to eat that. It's going to hurt you, not kill you, right? 
And you're like, ah, just, you know, it's Valentine's weekend, you know? Hey, hey, it's just a weekend, right? It's just one piece of chocolate cake. But what's, what's next weekend? In our family, when we get together with our family, we have like, from May to June, I think we have like 10 different family celebrations. So it ain't just one piece of chocolate cake. It's a little bit of this party and a little bit of that party and a little bit of that party. I am making an investment that I'm gathering on my waistline. It is paying dividends down the road. Now, here's the good news. Like, doing it one time isn't going to kill you. But the same way that going for a three-mile run one time doesn't make you a runner. But if you do that four times a week, you're making an investment in your health. You see, you can't just make a one-time decision and call it an investment. Investment is a slow, steady life with God where you're investing in things. And here's how I want to wrap this up. I want to wrap this up by talking about the investments that you're making. What are those areas? So here's the one question. Are you ready? It's the sixth and final question we're going to give you. Is this decision a good investment in my future? And here's a couple investment areas. One is health. We spent six weeks in, back in June talking about whole life, how about God cares about our bodies. And um, I got a guy in my community group, he's in this room, I'm not going to embarrass him, but um, was never a runner, and he started running. Started out like, I don't know, a half mile, a mile. And uh, he would come to community group and complain all the time. But then um, that six weeks ended, and you know what he did? He kept running. He's like Forrest Gump. I mean... He's still, okay, he's not running across the nation, but he's still running today because he believes that health is earned. God's love is given to us. It's not earned. But our health is earned one day at a time. It also fails one day at a time. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I'm not here to shame anybody about our health and our, our issues, but let me move on to the second area. Here's an obvious investment area. It's the financial one. So if I turn to Solomon's wisdom in the book of Proverbs and I start reading from here, here's Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Here's a very simple message. Work hard. Just work hard. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm almost terrified to make that statement in this valley because there's people who are working beyond hard in this valley trying to survive, trying to make it. I don't have time to go into this, but I'm just going to make this statement. There is a rhythm to working hard that God gave us. He said, work hard six days a week, and on the seventh day, stop working. Because on the eighth day, you'll be ready to work again. You go seven days a week, and you're just wrecking yourself. You're making a poor investment in yourself that will wreck you down the road. It won't wreck you right away. It'll just wreck you down the road. By the way, it's also a spiritual thing to say, I'm going to work six days a week. And that doesn't mean work at the office six days a week. That means you work at the office, you work at home, you work on your business, but you also just work on all your personal stuff, and then you rest. That's the rhythm to life. And uh, I know that our valley, we violate that all the time. So that's number one on money, work hard. The second is this, Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, your vats will brim over with new wine. Here's the second concept, give to God. Give to God first. Um, hey, if you're new to church, or you're just kind of checking this out for the first time, let me just say this. I'm not after your money. That's why when we do an offering, we're like, hey, if you're a guest with us, super glad you're here. Let that thing go by. We are not after your money. Here's what we're after. We're after your heart. We want you to know who the living God is, who has a plan for your life that is amazing. And we don't want money to stand in the way of that. But once God has a grip on your heart, and you discover that not 10% of what he gave you is a blessing from him, but 100% of what God gives you is a blessing from him. And the scripture says tithe. That means 10%. Like, give that back. It's not for anybody who's not a follower of Christ. It's just for those who say, man, Christ, he's given me so much. I want to give back. And that's the place where we start as our, our personal family is 10%. So when you work hard, you give to God. Here's the third thing. Proverbs 21.20 says this. The wise store up. And for this culture, it makes sense. Choice food and olive oil, but fo fools gulp theirs down. What he's trying to say here is store up for later and don't consume all you have. But we live in a culture where we, instead of consuming all we have, we actually consume more than what we have. We call it debt. <laughs> Nobody's amening, huh? Ah, amen by myself. 
Store up for later. So here's the money investment. Ready? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to work hard. We're going to give to God first, and then we're going to store up for later and not consume everything we have. And this might be one of the hardest places on the planet to do that. Or maybe it's not. Because we live in one of the wealthiest areas in the world, but yet it's one of the most expensive places to live in the world. Um, I'm not going to say it's easy. I'm just going to say don't look to the culture to like pat you on the back and encourage you in this. Let me read you some stats here. 10% of people said that they started saving for retirement in their teen years. 10%. 23% said they started saving for retirement in their 20s. Uh, the light bulb went on for 30-year-olds. 14% of them said that in their 30s they started saving for the retirement. Get this number. People age 50 to 64, 25% of them have not started saving anything for retirement. There's just no investing there. By the way, I'm not here to make you feel guilty. Just we all understand it's the wise decision. But how we spend money and how we value it, we have a choice. Third thing, relationships. Um, hopefully you're going to get today right, all right? It's Valentine's Day. If this is the first moment today that you've realized that, God bless you. Um, you know, hopefully it goes well for you. Um, but you're going to make an investment today, right? In a card, maybe some chocolates, maybe a dinner, maybe some, I, I don't know. And it might pay dividends for you later at night. But the investment I'm talking about is you make an investment, not just on Valentine's Day, because if you don't get today right, seriously, come on. Like, it's hard to screw up today, isn't it? Like, do something, and it's some kind of investment. But I'm talking about, like, next week and next month and the next quarter and by the end of the year. Are you still making those investments with words of encouragement? Maybe, maybe your wife likes getting flowers, and, like, I'm so, I love my wife so much. She doesn't like getting flowers. I'm just I'm blessed by that. And then, and then what about the next time you're going to be alone together and, and just go on a date? Can I ask you this? Do you have the next activity with your spouse, with your kids, with your loved one on the calendar right now? We have ski week this next week. I didn't think anybody was going to show up to church today. We've got our kids are off school next week. It's Valentine's Day. Y'all got nothing to do. I'm so glad. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you made the wise decision. Um, I'm really glad you're here. But my kids, uh, they're off this whole week, so we planned, like, they're 14 and 16, and um, when they were really young, they thought I was cool. Now they're, like, in high school, and now they know I'm cool. <laughs> um, so that's not really true. Um, so we have to spend intentional time together and really kind of put it together because they're busy and they're, I'm not as cool as I used to be. Um, Truth is, they now know me for who I really am. So tomorrow afternoon, Kelly, Courtney, and I, my son's at Tahoe snowboarding for the Lord in heavenly. Um, so tomorrow noon, we're going to go and uh, take these little orange clays and fling them and shoot them out of the sky with shotguns because that's what my daughter likes to do. I'm just going along for the ride. It wasn't my idea, people, okay? And so we're going to go do that tomorrow because you know what I love? I love months or years from now for my kids to go, Dad, you remember when we, because that's an investment in my kid's life. And who knows, tomorrow on this ranch where we go, sometimes the pigs come in and we'll do a little hunting too. We could be building delicious memories. <laughs> Jalapeno cheese dogs after this. Well, m since my son's at Heavenly building memories without us, um, I'm going to take him on Friday and go do the same thing. Why? We got to build memories. They're investments in our kids' life. It's not that I got nothing to do. Like, I only work on Sunday, right? It ain't funny. <laughs> so, I, I got stuff to do, super busy, but I just know this at the end of our life, we're not going to go, you know what? I really wish I would have spent one more day at the office. Here's what the scripture says Let love and faithfulness never leave you. I know it sounds like, hey, love God, be faithful to God, but here's what it says. Bind this love and faithfulness around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then, here's the result, you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Meaning this, be faithful and loving to people as well. Invest in them so that it pays dividends in the end. Um, let me give you the last one, and we'll wrap up with this. 
The last one is investing in wisdom and spiritual maturity. Proverbs 23 says, states it this way, invest in truth and wisdom, discipline and good sense, and don't part from them. The wise store up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool invites ruin. Um, every morning, roll out of bed. There's some days that I, man, I, I'm just, I'm doing too much, and I just run straight to work to go do God's business. But every day that I stop and I start with this, I'm investing. And it might, I might read it that day and go, I have no idea what that was about. Why would I need to hear that, Lord? But if I store it up and I'm writing it down, I'm trying to think about this and store it up, there's going to be a situation that comes my way that I have to be prepared and have the kind of wisdom that God has wanted to give me all along. Because here's the truth. I had a pastor say it this way. He said, there is no cramming for wisdom. There's no like, you remember when you had the test in college or high school and you forgot to study and it's like 1030 at night, you're like, oh, cram session, we're doing an all-nighter, got to be ready for that test. There's no all-nighters for wisdom. There's no all-nighter for spiritual maturity. There's no all-nighter or cram session for your health, for money, or for relationships. You can't cram it in. All you can do is over time invest in it. So I want you to hear this as we wrap up here. Many of our wise decisions revolve around how we choose to spend our time. So what's on your calendar? Is it people? Is on your calendar things that will invest in your health? Is on your calendar things that will actually invest in your wealth as well? So here's our perspective. God, give me the perspective that Solomon used to have, but then God, keep me away from losing it the way he did. God, I want to live in total dependence on you. So can I give you just three quick tools? I stole these from Chip and Dan Heath in their book, Decisive. If you want to dig in deeper into how to make wise decisions, read this book. It's amazing. You're not going to hear a bunch of Bible verses in there. They're just going to give you some real practical wisdom on business and family life, how to make decisions. They would say this, uh, the 10-10-10 tool. It just says this, once you make this decision, how will you feel in the next 10 minutes, the next 10 months, and the next 10 years? If you make a decision, you're like, 10 years from now, it doesn't even matter. It's like, okay, well, then it's probably not a very important decision. If 10 months from now, no one's going to remember, or you're like, and I'm not talking moral decisions, okay? We, that, that was a week back. But 10 months from now, if you're like, oh my, no, this sets me on a whole new path and trajectory. The next 10, 10 months, everything could change if I make this one decision. You might want to pause and wait for God's wisdom to come to you. Let me give you another one. Do a pre-mortem. You know when something dies and they do an autopsy? It's a post-mortem to figure out why it died. The decision that you're making today, let's pretend it turns out really bad. You're in the middle of a project at work and you have to have head one of two directions. Maybe you're you're looking at two different positions at work. I'm either going to report to this person or this person. Journey forward in both of those. Pretend it turns out really badly and both of those situations die. The project you're you're gonna head into, let's pretend it died. Answer this question, what killed it? Why did it turn out so badly? And then you start tracing it back to go, can we fix that now that we know what might kill it? Now, there's some unknowns there that you might not know, like you might not be able to predict, but obviously there are some things that we could probably foresee and say, if that's gonna kill it, can we fix it? And if not, maybe we need to walk away from that. I'm not saying we don't ever take decisions or make decisions based off of like risk because there's some faith in risk, but there's some foolish risk that we take sometimes. Not just a a pre-mortem. What about a pre-parade? A year from now, someone's going to throw a parade in your honor based off of the decision you're going to make today. The the parade that's going to happen a year from now, what would make it wildly successful? The decision you're going to make about your family's finances today. If they're going to celebrate you a year from now, what would it take along the way for them to throw a parade in your honor? And could you put those on a calendar and do that? Because no one plans to fail. Solomon didn't plan to fail. He just didn't look at the decisions right in front of me and go, God, teach me to number my days because 10 years down the line, I still want to be a good king. Still want to be a good husband, not to a thousand women. (laughs) Still want to be a good dad. I still want to be a man after your heart, God. So God, help me with my perspective and invest in my life in a wise way. Um, 
So over this series, I've really tried to just say, hey, here's some questions for you to make wise decisions. Do you remember week one? Week one started with Solomon's life, and we just asked this question. Beyond what I want, I want what God wants. So we asked the question, what does God want? I don't know if you've been coming back to church for the last five weeks because you're like, ah, that that was a good question. I kind of want to know what the next five questions are so that I can be wiser, make good decisions at work, be the hero of our house, and you know, all that kind of stuff. But for some of you, you actually have yet to say yes to God, meaning this. Yeah, God, I want to make wise decisions, but truly at the heart of this, I'm not going to make wise decisions if I'm not in relationship with you. God, I want to be a follower of you. And some of you, you're trying to gain God's wisdom, and you're trying to glean understanding, and that's awesome. That is really smart to do. You will glean, glean some understanding and gain some wisdom. But if you're not here to say, God, I actually do want to do with you. I want to be in relationship with you, and I want to follow you. Some of you are here for the wisdom and not the relationship with God. I'm just going to tell you, it just doesn't work that way. God first wants relationship with you before he ever wants to pour his wisdom on you. He loves you. And I just know this, some of you, you've just never committed your life to Christ. Others of you, you were like Solomon. Maybe you grew up blessed, your dad gave you the blessing, and their parents went to church. I mean, you walked with God, and somewhere along the way, you pulled a nevertheless. I mean, that moment that you knew what it was like to follow God, and nevertheless, you did your own thing, and you wandered from God, I have some great news for you. There is nobody who is beyond God's reach. You're not beyond God's reach. Remember I told you, it's not too late to jump from a path without God to a path with God. And instead of wandering away, just make a turning point moment and wander back. I'd be a fool to go through a series like this and not make an offer to you to say, why not today? Why not give your life to Christ today? Why not come back to God from your wandering today? Because I want you to know this, he will take anybody back. And so let's stop for a moment, and I want to pray. I want to give that invitation a moment to just sit in your soul. Let's bow our heads. If you know in the last two and a half minutes since I started talking about this, that you are not in relationship with God and you want to be, just know this, he loves you. And if you, if you want that, then it's a conversation with God. God, I'm so sorry. God, I want to know you. I want to follow you. I want to be in relationship with you, not just glean your wisdom, not just read your word. I want a relationship with you. And for some of you, you know you wandered away, and you, you can sense it right now in your seat. You're like fighting back a tear right now, and you're, you're just thinking, God, I need to come back to you because I'm not following you. If that's you today, here's what we're going to do. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If today needs to be a moment where you return to God, I want you to do this. In your seat right now, I want you to put your hands straight up in the air. This is just you and me. My eyes are open, okay? So we're sharing this moment. Yes and yes. Yes, 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 yes. Your hands are up and I see you, yes. Now there's some of you, you're sitting here and you're chicken. That's not a Greek spiritual term, you just chicken. And you're like, but if I do, I just don't know. And you're like, man, I've just missed the opportunity. You didn't. Here it is again. Make that decision. Who is it? Is there anybody else before we go? I'm watching. Yes. Yes, I got you in the back. I got you, middle schooler. I got you in the back there too. I got both your hands. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. Let's come before God and just talk to him. You put these words into your own words, and you know, it's not a magical prayer. It's just an authentic conversation with God. Something like this, God, forgive me. God, I want to come back to you, or God, I want to start a relationship with you for the first time. God, move in my life right now. God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die on a cross to forgive me so I could be in a relationship with you, and God, I want that relationship today. And so from this day forward, I'm going to do life with you, not without you. But help me, God, because I need you. i got to figure out more about what that looks like. And if that's your prayer, man, you are in the family of God. He loves you, and he is celebrating that you've had a turning point in your life. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can I have all of you stand in church just real quick? Uh, how do we feel about people when they come to Christ? <laughs> Thank you.
Here's what we're going to do in this moment right here. I just want to give you some space to be with God. If you're a follower of Christ, uh, there's communion elements there and there and there and there. And my invitation to you is this. The band's going to lead in a song. And um, you can go up there and grab some bread and grab juice. It symbolizes the body of Christ that uh, was broken for our sins. And his blood was poured out so we could be forgiven. I'm just grab it. You can go around the room and talk to God. Have just a moment of honest conversation. And then eat and drink on your own in remembrance of the great gift of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us. And listen, you don't have to belong to our church to be able to do that. You just got to be a follower of Christ to, to do that. And for any of you that you just had a turning point in your life, you're totally welcome to do this. This is for you as well. And so if you want to stand there and sing, however you want to do this, just have a moment and be with God, and I'll wrap us up in just a minute. Ryan, let's do this. <laughs>